I want you to be in a good mood today. Right. You seem like you are, but I want to put you in an even better mood. Okay. So before we get mildly contentious or uh, into substantive discussion of, of, of great matters of historical uh, import, I want to ask you this opening question. Which was the greater thrill of your governorship? Throwing out the first ball for the Detroit Tigers baseball game or that eagle you made about six weeks ago at the home course on that par five. Well, that's what an eagle would be on, isn't it? A yeah. par five uh, there in Searcy. Uh, which one means more to you in historical context? <laughs> And if you feel necessary to describe both experiences briefly, go ahead. Actually, uh, as, I, as most politicians do when you ask them a question, uh, we're not going to answer it directly. <laughs> we're off uh, to ex the expected start. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm going to substitute an answer. Uh, neither one of those were the greatest thrills uh, of uh, the time I've been governor. The greatest thrill uh, for me as governor was that first Christmas in the governor's mansion when Ginger said, get out of the way, you don't have to do any decorating. <laughs> so that's how it's gonna go. Uh, Ginger, had he ever done any decorating? I didn't think so. Just, you just don't strike me as a decorator. Uh, Okay, let's get started. And here I'm going to divide this. We've got to get this done in an hour, and I've got a lot of important things to, uh, uh, to ask. Just so you'll know wh what I'm trying to do, sort of set some context for your public service career, the little background. Then the meat of the discussion, your governorship and its legacy or questions of legacy, which I know you're very tired of my talking and writing about. Uh, and then we'll close with what are you going to be doing? What are you going to possibly do after losing your essence and going back to Cersei? Uh, and, not, and how are you going to keep from going mad uh, 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 in, in this retirement? I told you it's a eulogy. Right. <laughs> First of all, I think a good place to start for background to, to, to establish your public service career. The first I ever heard of Mike Beebe of Cersei was a young man reading the Arkansas Gazette and there was a short article in the paper that said Governor Dale Bumpers, this is 1974, mm -hmm. had appointed to the Arkansas State University Board of Trustees mm -hmm. a prestigious appointment, mm -hmm. those are big appointments, uh, a 27 year old lawyer from Searcy. Making $700 a month. <laughs> You, you wind up doing better than that. Uh, but not as governor necessarily. Uh, and I remember thinking, this is a moment to record, because I had great instincts even then. And <laughs> I thought, you know, this is 27 years old. How does a guy, 27 years old, six years graduated from the school you're going on the board of, yeah. three or four years out of law school, two, two years out of law school, uh, and I now know 27 years out of a tar paper shack. Yeah. How do you get on the radar of the governor of the state to get an appointment? Tell us, how did that happen? Well, uh, there are a lot of people who take credit for it, just like you take credit for my whole career. I do. I do. <laughs> You're going to have to ease up during this. <laughs> uh, one, of the, one of the people, uh, one of the, I guess the guy that talks about it the most that takes credit for it is uh, the famous Archie Schaefer. Uh, Archie Schaefer uh, was, uh, I was his pledge trainer in college at ASU. And he had evolved as Dale Bumper's nephew to be Dale Bumper's chief of staff, executive secretary, whatever they call him. You couple that with the fact that it was Dale Bumper's last appointment. So everybody he owed anything to with regard to the ASU board of trustees, apparently he had already satisfied uh, or felt like he owed it, he'd already satisfied those obligations. You couple that with the fact that I had a senior partner, Ed Lytle, who had served in the Arkansas Senate for eight years, and uh, being Ed Lytle, and the way a lot of folks did it back then, he just quit. He said eight's enough, and uh, 
and didn't run anymore, but he still had relationships with a, a lot of those senators at the time. Uh, and I asked him for help, and he wrote every senator. Uh, I guess every senator, if not everyone, virtually everyone, all of me knew. And so, depending on whether you believe Ed Lytle, or whether you believe Archie Schaefer, or whether you believe the fact that uh, they'd run out of people that asked for it, uh, that's how that occurred because, you know, I owed Dale Bumper nothing, he owed me nothing, uh, and, uh, and that's a true story of, uh, of all that, uh, how all that occurred, uh, which I guess was my first introduction to, uh, the first time I was ever in the Capitol was to come down there and meet with Dale Bumpers before the appointment. What did he ask you? I don't remember. <laughs> have you appointed anyone as young as 27 to a- uh, Yeah, I'm sure I have. To, to a university board? Uh, I'm not sure I appointed anyone as young as 27 to the university board. I think uh, Jim Argue's daughter was younger than 27 when I put her on uh, the board. So the short answer is you were politically connected at 27. You were the if you believe the if governor's you believe, nephew's a, a, it, a pledge guy, and you had gone to work for a prominent politically connected law firm. All that serendipity. I'm sure it was my skill in, in persuading <laughs> All right. Can Let's, you imagine how scared I was, you know, uh, 27 years old and the first time in the Capitol, and, you know, Dale Bumpers was uh, a persona in his own right. I mean, I was pretty scared. I, I was drawn up. You got over that over time. <laughs> okay, let's fast forward to 1983. This is, uh, this is even more interesting to me, and I've never gotten an answer to this, and I've often wondered. 1983, Clinton has, has uh, won back the governorship, and you have been elected to the state senate, typically without an opponent. Uh, uh, and uh, you show up as a young state senator, uh, 1983. I've been covering the state capitol three or four years, and people are saying- You used to go have a beer with us. Yeah, well, I, mean, we, I did, and, and we can still do that. Uh, and I remember people saying to me, and this is the truth, I, I don't want to feed your ego necessarily, but people were saying, watch this Mike Beebe. He, this new senator from Cersei, he's the heir apparent to Bill Clinton. He's smart, he's affable, He's moderate, has an excellent head of hair. <laughs> and Buster Brown, yeah. He, he's the guy, he's the guy. And then I wanna tell you what Bill Clinton said to me one time. He said, people talk about B.B. becoming governor. The future president said, have you been in his house up at Cersei? Anybody who's got a house like that doesn't need to run for governor because you are now in your mid-30s and as I understand it, tell me if this is true, you had handled as the trial lawyer, plaintiff's lawyer, a case that resulted at that point in the biggest judgment to that date in the history of the state. Yeah. Tell about that case and tell how much you got. No, uh, uh. <laughs> tell it, I mean, look here, 27 years out of the tar paper shack, you are on the ASU Board of Trustees, 35 years, 36 years out of the tar paper shack, you're rich. Uh, tell about that case, tell, tell how that came to be. <laughs> well, it was a tragic case, as most of those cases are, uh, and uh, a young man uh, with, uh, who had married his uh, high school sweetheart, had four children, stair-stepped like eight, six, four, and two, worked full-time for an electric company, a co-op, uh, lived uh, just north of the dam at Heber Springs. He, uh, like a lot of people, uh, also had a farm and a side business in that he raised chickens. Uh, he had two chicken houses. Uh, it was during the middle of the energy crisis when, uh, it was 1979, middle of the energy crisis, so a lot of folks were going to alternative fuels. He went to a wood-burning furnace to heat the two chicken houses. The two chicken houses were separated by, uh, in his pasture by a quarter of a mile, maybe a little bit more than that. Uh, they installed the two wood-burning furnaces. 
it was Christmas time, he had family coming in, and so he was going uh, to fix a water line in one of the chicken houses, and uh, he was going to stay up and do that so he could uh, have time with the family at Christmas time. About five o'clock in the morning, two young boys driving down the highway, uh, going to work, uh, saw flames uh, in this chicken house and went up and beat on the door uh, of the residence. The young wife comes out and she says, oh my God, my husband's up there because he was going to work. So they run up there, they get to the door, he's collapsed right at the door and they pull him out, he's dead. Uh, about in a small town, you know, people congregate to console, they bring in food, there's all sorts of neighbors and relatives and friends, and lo and behold, the other chicken house catches on fire. And, of course, they don't have a clue about what's going on. Everybody runs out there and uh, starts to help put that fire out, and they do. The difference in the two chicken houses were, was only one thing. First of all, the fire was started by improperly installed flues by a company that made wood-burning furnaces, and they didn't install the furnaces correctly. It caught adjacent chicken house uh, shed that was built onto the chicken house to house the wood-burning furnace. In both instances, that defective installation caused the fire. It was the first night they were really fired up. It was the first cold night. They were new uh, structures and new furnishes, furnaces. And so the, the coincidence of both of them catching fire within hours of each other uh, was a pretty easy factual situation to figure out what happened. The only difference in the two chicken houses, one of them was cellular plastic insulation called poly polyisocyanurate. I call it styrofoam. <laughs> And the other one had the traditional uh, bat insulation, the, the traditional fiberglass insulation. In the one, he dies with the new stuff with the fiberglass, I mean with the uh, uh, styrofoam. In the other, nobody even gets a headache. In the course of the investigation, we determined that that product produces cyanide when it burns. Wow. If you got it in your house, don't worry about it. I got it in my house. As long as it's behind sheetrock or behind something, you don't get it, unless you're already burned up anyway and you didn't get out. It, it's safe to use behind sheetrock or gypsum board or any, any other protective covering. This company marketed it for use exposed in uh, agricultural buildings, notwithstanding the fact that we found out later uh, in discovery that their research and development arm was telling their marketing arm quit doing this stuff exposed, it produces cyanide, it's going to kill somebody, and, and marketing writes back and says, quit worrying about it, they don't have any building codes in rural America. So that, wow. ir that irritated a Heber Springs jury. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a state court judgment? Yeah. Now, the, the neat thing about that was I called Ginger about four or five years later, and I said, Ginger, I got good news and bad news. She said, what's the bad news? I said, my state record's broken. She said, what's the good news? I said, I broke it. <laughs> you did another one? Bigger than that one, yeah. We don't have time for that one. No. Uh, <laughs> really? Yeah. What was the year of the first one? The, year of the, the, ju the verdict was in 81. It, the, the fire occurred in 79. What, when was the record broken? When was the second one? 86. Oh, after you're in the Senate. Yeah. Okay. Here's where I was going with that. Uh, in those days, the two rising political stars in the, on the, in the Democratic Party in Arkansas were Mike Beebe and a young man from Lowell named David Matthews. Yeah. You know David. Yeah. David served through the 80s in the House. Yeah. And then he goes back and practices law. Yeah. And he's had a very happy, successful, prosperous career as a lawyer. Yeah. Now represents Swepco, does some lobbying. Somewhere along the way, and I didn't know you had a case after you'd come to the Senate, because I think along the way, Correct me if I'm wrong. You become the managing partner of that law firm, and you de-emphasize your actual legal work, which has been so successful, because you become obsessed that, with state government. That's half true. Uh, the obsession with state government part is true. Uh, and my partners might tell you that my workload was significantly de-emphasized. But it wasn't because I decided to get out of practicing law. 
Ginger had become too accustomed to the lifestyle to what she had been afforded. <laughs> I couldn't quit practicing law. So what I ended up, I ended up with uh, very few cases, but they were huge. And I had a lot of them. I didn't have uh, any more that were uh, as large as those two. But uh, I ended up with a lot of cases. And, and uh, I had the luxury of a firm. And they could do the quantity of the work. And I could concentrate on, on big okay. stuff. So okay. no, I never de-emphasized what I was doing in the firm in terms of income or what I was doing that brought into the firm. Well, you could, have, you could have said, this is great work. I'm making a difference for these people against uh, the, the injustices that, uh, that, and I've made a lot of money and I'm just gonna become a, I'm just gonna keep doing this. But you didn't. I mean, you, you took to state government like nobody I've ever seen. <laughs> I don't know, have you met Morrill? He's pretty good. Well, he took to your interests. You know, he was Bobby to your JFK. You know, that's where that worked. Uh, well, you, this guy writes a column one day. I never will forget this. Now, there's a question pending. Uh, I'm going to interrupt your question. <laughs> he writes a column one day extolling Morrill Harriman's uh, virtue. You know, I'm the guy getting all this glory. And, and, and so all of a sudden, he's going to tout Morrill, who's like a brother. I mean, I'm the closest thing. And the governor's got, chief of staff, in case, in case you're wondering. We serve in the Senate together. And he writes his column, and it's right in the middle of the Chicago Bulls' heyday. And he says, Mike Beebe may be Michael Jordan of politics, but Morrill Harriman is the Scottie Pippen and probably the more valuable player. <laughs> Morrill, would you care to rise and accept applause? really hurt my feelings. I just wanted to know. You just wanted to say that I compared you to Michael Jordan. That's you know true. That. Uh, no, you decided early. I remember you saying, before you even thought about being governor, I want to be the next Knox Nelson. And by that you meant... The good, the good side. Yeah. I love this state senate. I love this Leslie. I want to run this place. I want, I want to, this, is, this is what I want to do. Yeah. I mean, you... Is, is, that, is that a spirit of public service? Uh, you, of course you're going to say, well, yes. Uh, is it, uh, well, I mean. I loved it. I mean, I loved the process. Uh, I loved being able to help effectuate public policy. We did some really, really good stuff. I mean, we, we did things that uh, a lot of folks uh, to this day uh, benefit from. Uh, I know that sounds kind of hokey, but it's, but it's true. I had the luxury of having uh, a situation that I was only 50 miles away from the Capitol so I could work and still come down here for meetings and, and, and do things. Uh, I had the kind of practice in the law firm that wasn't uh, hour intensive. It wasn't requiring billing out hours. Uh, other people in the firm had that part of the practice. I had a part of the practice that afforded me uh, some more freedom. I loved the Senate and the camaraderie. Uh, I liked to uh, what all went on, and, and really I had the best of both worlds because I had a real job with real income, and I could still be involved in public policy and help try to guide Arkansas to make her better. And this really sounds hokey, uh, and we've been kind of bantering back and forth, but the truth of the matter is it was a, a state with an education system and a country with an opportunity and a mother that gave me every chance that caused a kid from the background you're talking about to have my share of the American dream. I made more money than I ever thought I'd, I'd make. Uh, I had a, a wonderful uh, family. I had uh, all the amenities that uh, America talks about. And if you don't think you owe something back to make sure somebody else can get that kind of stuff, you're not worth the powder it takes to blow you away. And so. <laughs> Covering the legislature in those days was waiting to see what came out of the State House of Representatives <laughs> and then going down to see Senator Beebe and saying, what's going to happen to it down here? Because you could tell. You knew in those days, through the 90s. You were the autocrat down there, weren't you? I was a benevolent dictator. <laughs> no, no, no. No, we, we had a cadre. Truly, we had a cadre 
of, uh, of folks that, that really did well. You're talking about coming out of the house. It's another great Moral Harriman story. Got time for this? You know, you I'll, to shut up? I'll do a show with Moral some other time. No, go, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, it, it's a great Senate story. You know, the, the Senate Judiciary Committee was known as the F-15 Committee of the legislature. We shot everything down. It was a great committee, seven lawyers that were really, really, I don't know, everybody doesn't like lawyers, but the, this was diverse. We had defense lawyers, we had prosecutors, we had corporate, we had, uh, and all, all seven were, were very talented folks. Wayne Dowd's chair, and he gets this new uh, Republican state rep who was an insurance agent, uh, who's turned out to be a good friend, uh, Dennis Young, from Texacana, who comes up there with this tort reform idea that uh, he wants to adopt Texas tort reform. And, he comes up with this god-awful bill. If you were for tort reform, it was still an awful bill. I mean, it was <laughs> poorly written, you know, all kinds of stuff. And as to John's point, the House passed it, because the House used to pass everything. <laughs> and they knew we'd kill it. Uh, so it comes over, it comes over to Senate Judiciary, and Dad calls us all together and said, all right, guys, don't be smart, Alex. It's not the word he used, but uh, he said, uh, this is my new state rep. He's a nice fellow. We don't want to embarrass him. We know we're not going to pass this bill, but be nice, which was not in our nature. <laughs> and so uh, we're trying to be nice. He presents this bill, and it's awful. And Moral is questioning him, trying to let him down easy, and said, uh, Mr. Young, I notice in your, in your bill, you say in here several times, you use the term ultra-hazardous condition. Nowhere in there do you describe what an ultra-hazardous condition is. And Young pops off and says, you can look that up in Webster's. Moral closed his book, looked at him and said, Mr. Young, this is Senate Judiciary. If Mr. Webster wants to try to get on the agenda, we'll see if we can accommodate him. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, do not pass. Second, bam, out the door he went. That's as nice as we were going to be. <laughs> but that speaks to your point about how the Senate and look, I'm not deflecting all this praise you're trying to put on me about running the Senate. I'm not putting praise. Uh, I think it's inappropriate, the power that you have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then I'm glad I'm deflecting. Right. <laughs> but it certainly made it easy to find out what was going on. Uh, okay, one more introductory question. I want to ask this for years, and then I want to get serious. Okay. The day you become governor. Yeah. I think I'm right about this. And I know you've got to remember it. It's not your inaugural address. You get sworn in in the House chamber. Mm -hmm. And it is a customary, it's not your state of the state, it's not your inaugural address, but you go down to the well of the House and make some remarks at that time, don't you? After you sworn in? I don't know, at some, maybe. Oh, maybe not, I did, I don't remember. After you had been sworn in and you're making some remarks, you look out to someone in the House chamber and you do this. Yeah, and, the you, sting, wrote, the and sting, you wrote about it. I did. The sting, like, you, who were you looking at and what was the sting? I can't tell you, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> really? I don't know, there was a cadre of us that after that movie, we were all young and dumb and, and full of ourselves and, and uh, cocky and uh, some of us got over it, some of us didn't. <laughs> Did and you have it, a prearrangement with somebody? No, that, no, it was pretty spontaneous. There were about six or eight of us. Uh, you can imagine who some of them were. The Watneys of the world, the uh, Morals of the world. Uh, Cliff Huffman? Yeah, uh, no, Cliff never did that. We, okay. We, we, uh, All right. Cliff did other stuff, but we didn't. <laughs> All right. It was, it was an innocuous... I didn't mean to say it wasn't. I just wondered what, the, what it was. Because you wrote about it. I did. So it was some kind of okay. masonry... Masonic right. Lodge secret uh, take over the world. No, it actually stirred up some Republicans who said, look here, it's proof. It's a joke. It's a joke. They've got a joke in on us. It's a, they pulled a fast one on the electorate that that's what they meant. I knew that's not what you meant. <laughs> okay, let's go to the governorship and let's get to uh, your two favorite words that I've used uh, in recent times. Transactional leadership and transformational leadership. Stop. They are... <laughs> They are not my favorite words. Nobody in the world even cares about those two words except you. <laughs> nobody's ever really written about those two words except you, and nobody's misused them any more than you. 
All right. Uh, <laughs> nobody's ever written about them because nobody else has ever covered state government like I covered. Now, uh, transformation, let's not, let's not do that. Let me offer, without using those words, my assessment of your governorship and get you to just play off that. Sure. The most effective governorship, perhaps in the state's history, for dealing with the issues that, ar that arose during your time. Right. Passing legislation, three-fourths votes to raise the cigarette tax for the trauma centers, three-fourths vote negotiated with the industry to raise the severance tax to prepare, repair some of the roads, getting the private option, getting, getting people to, 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 to on their own percolate uh, the private option, managing the state budget, transactionally, forgive me, you, you transacted government beautifully. Uh, and I think everyone would agree, Nobody, nobody's done as well. In terms of, a his, of historical context, in terms of what I have called transformational leadership, but change that, is, that causes a legacy that will continue through no fault of your own because your style is to deal with the transaction and because a revolution quite independent of you sprang up around you. That is the aversion to Obama and the republicanization of the state. Your place in history is great governor for his time, but the end of an era. Please respond. Well, it's the end of mine and your era. No, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, you are. <laughs> They're not going to talk to you anymore. That's actually, well, okay. I know, I know. Okay. I know. That's a joke. That's, okay. to, to be serious about it, all of this stuff is cyclical. And, and let's put this in context. In 2006, when I ran the first time, we had all the Democrats won all the constitutional officers. We ran, we won all the, the congressional stuff except in the third district. We won huge majorities, even bigger majorities than what they'd had before in the legislature. In 2008, it went even larger than that uh, because we had uh, the Republicans didn't even field a candidate against Mark Pryor. Didn't even feel a candidate. And the margins increased. The big switch was in 2010. And in 2010, even though the gains have increased in 12 and 14 to the majorities, the biggest single year of the gain was in 2010, when their largest increase uh, of the Republican membership in the House and the Senate uh, occurred, when every contested constitutional race that they had, they won except the governor's race and when they beat Blanche Lincoln and had the greatest uh, increase in the congressional delegation. And yet in 2010, I won every county in the midst of the largest Republican tide. I'm getting to where I'm getting to here in a minute. Subsequently, the tide grew even larger in 2012 and 2014. The only fact that I can relate that to, and I think we've got some Republican friends in the back, uh, and I've made this statement a jillion, jillion times, uh, it's not just Arkansas, it's all over America. And it's the result of the White House and the President and the policies, whether you like the President, whether you don't, whether you like the policies, whether you don't, the national mood has been to reject those policies. And so you've seen this tide. I, I point all that out to tell you as evidence of how cyclical this process is. If the Republicans govern wisely, if the, the public is confident of the way things are going, then this could be a longer term result. If they don't, it could be a short term. In either event, it's going to be cyclical. So to say it's the end of an era is to suggest that nothing ever changes and it always does. As a practical matter, what we've seen is a strange coalition in Arkansas and I suspect around the country. It's manifested itself really in those three-fourths votes that you, that you talk about. But a coalition of Democrats and what I call pragmatic business Republicans 
that have worked together across party lines and across the aisle to solve problems and to get things done. And I get a lot of credit for that. Truth of the matter is none of that happens without the legislature. And none of it happens without Republican and Democratic leadership in the legislature working together to solve those problems. And uh, if that continues, notwithstanding a three-fourths requirement, Arkansas will continue to prosper. If the Tea Party branch and the folks who don't seem to work together with those two demographics that I've just mentioned are successful in stopping some of these things, in my opinion, that big middle group that calls themselves independents now will gravitate back to the D where they have been gravitating to the R in the last two elections. So it depends on what they do and how they govern as to how quick this cycle reverses itself. 